Welcome again. Good morning. Welcome to this Europark webinar. My name is Esther Bossink. I'm Europark's communications manager, and I will be leading you through this webinar today. So to start off with a couple of um, house rules, which I think you also already saw in our um, waiting room. So again, welcome. Um, this webinar is being recorded. So um, we do still welcome you to keep your camera on and also change your name. You can do so by going to the participants list and finding yourself and then you hover over it and then three little dots will appear that allow you to change your name. Because um, at Europark, we also in an online setting still really welcome this feeling of ex exchange and um, getting to know each other. And in that sense, um, maybe it would be nice to just start by writing in the chat where your feet are touching the ground. So for me today, my feet are touching the ground in Porto, in Portugal, in a very rainy Portugal, I might add. And um, so yeah, feel free to let us know where you are from in the chat. And furthermore, you can also post your questions in the chat. Now, um, you will notice that you can, as I said, change your name, you can turn your camera on. What you cannot do is unmute yourself. Um, however, there has been a slight change in our webinar program, and I'll tell a little bit more about that in a second. But um, as such, we have a little bit more time. So after the presentation, we welcome you to open up your microphone and ask any questions you might have directly to our speaker. Of course, if you don't feel very comfortable speaking up for a larger group of people, then just pop your question in the chat and we'll try to get to it um, at the same time. Um, you can find all of Europark's previous webinars, both on our website, that's why we were recording them, and also you will find the recording of this webinar in your inbox in a couple of days. So. The Europark Federation. Now, I just want to really briefly take a few seconds to, um, yeah, explain a little bit more about the organization that I'm very happy to be working for. So that's the Europark Federation. I hope that most of you might already know us, um, but if not, we are the largest network of protected areas in Europe. We have around 400 members in 40 countries. And as you can see, many of them are indeed protected areas, but there's also other institutions. However, we like to think of ourselves not just as a network of organizations, but a network of people and a meeting of the mind, so to say. Um, so we really want to share um, our experiences amongst the network and really facilitate this international exchange to yeah, become a better protected area manager. Now, how do we do that? We do that by facilitating networking um, and that, for example, through a webinar like this, but also our online and offline conferences, our seminars, workshops, uh, we have different training opportunities. So we really try through that matter to, yeah, in whatever way we can support parks and protected area, um, uh, people working in parks and protected areas to be the very best that they can be professionally. And most of all, we try to do that in a very fun manner. So I guess that people that may have attended our conferences or other events can, can attest to this, that it really is a meeting of friends. Furthermore, on our website, you will find loads and loads of information like t case studies and toolkits. And also um, an important element of our job or of our work is that we lobby or as we like to say dialogue for the interests of protected areas um, at European institutions and we create policy papers to that extent as well. So on that note, I'd just like to make everybody aware of this year's European Day of Parks. If you don't know, the European Day of Parks is a commemorative day for parks and protected areas in Europe. It takes place every year on the 24th of May. And this year we're asking to vote for nature because we truly believe that in our parks and protected areas, uh, policy decisions are brought to life. So you can join the celebrations by organizing, organizing an event 
or um, yeah, on the 24th of May, help us make some noise for our parks and protected areas to ensure that they get the attention and love they deserve. My colleague Sandra has already popped uh, a link in the chat to where you can find more information. And um, also to quickly introduce Sandra, she will help me today with all the technical elements of this webinar. So if you're having some technical difficulties, feel free to, to pop her a message. Very briefly, we have different programs and projects, for example, on sustainable tourism or on transboundary corporation, our youth programs or Healthy Parks, Healthy People Europe. And related to that, we have a range of projects as well. All of them, we really try to build the capacity of protected area managers to yeah, assure that we have better results for people and nature. Again, all this information is on our website. I really invite you to check it out and see how you can get involved. And of course, I would not be a good um, communications manager if I did not invite you to follow us on social media. So uh, follow us on the social media of your choice. I'd say we're pretty much anywhere or everywhere that is. And we post very regularly. So that will ensure that you don't miss any exciting opportunity event uh, for protected area managers. And yeah, we welcome you to give us a follow and I hope to see you there. Okay, do. So that was quickly about Europark, but of course we are here today for our webinar, Shaping Park Identity and Exploring How Sense of Place and Co-Creation Can Unlock a Park's Potential. So we're going to be speaking about identity today. Now, I did have a quick look at how the Cambridge Dictionary defines identity, which is a person's name and other facts about who they are. Of course, I would say identity is a lot more. And identity is an important tool for destinations to market themselves and to attract the right kind of people or, what, or the people that they feel would benefit most from a visit. For example, if we think about big cities around the world, then we have maybe a very clear idea in mind already of their identity. If you see this picture of Amsterdam, there's probably, you will probably immediately have certain thoughts and ideas that come to mind. Maybe amazing museums or maybe more negative feelings associated like over tourism or um, intoxicated tourists roaming the streets. At the same time, just like cities or big tourist attractions have a very specific identity and ID surrounding them, our natural heritage holds a wealth of information and stories and identities. And in our natural heritage, history comes together to shape unique landscapes. And these landscapes itself are influenced by the natural processes that take, pla that take place there but also the people that live and work in them. And there we have many very thrilling stories to discover. So how can we harvest this? How can we harvest this park identity to welcome new people into our protected area? And how can we use that to bring them closer to nature and help them understand just why it's so important to protect that what we have? Now I would just really be interested, we are around 50 people here today, and I'd love to hear if your park or protected area has already gone through an identity creation process. So for that, I have a very simple poll that my colleague Sandra will launch. Um, just asking that question, have you ever worked on creating a park identity? And just say yes or no, I'll give, a few seconds, it's a quite an easy question, I think. I can already see the answers coming in. So thank you for taking that time. Perfect. Sandra, feel free to broadcast the results. So you can see that over half hasn't, but um, quite a few of you have already worked on creating a park identity. And um, as a follow-up to that, I'd love to hear and this is for both if you have or if you haven't, but who the stakeholders were that you involved in this process. 
So who have you worked with? Whose stories did you want to harvest? Who do you believe were the people that yeah capture the identity of your area best and this can also be if you not have have not yet started this process but are you thinking about it who would be the stakeholders that you, you would like to involve in this identity creation so to do so you can just go to menti.com and use the code that you see here on the screen and there you can provide your answers or you can also click on the link in the chat that sandra has sent and send your answers there and we will share the results that are coming up. Yeah, local communities, of course, the locals, farmers, teachers, that's an interesting one as well. Children, yeah, I think you can get some very interesting inputs from, from your young people in your area, I'm sure. Land managers, farmers, the local government, yes, local authorities. Very good. Now, I think there's no right or wrong answer to this. And I think also that there's very, there's multiple ways of going about this process. So I'll let you populate that a bit longer. You can also see it on, on your side as well. But of course, who knows the identity of your area better than the local community. Probably no one. So they would um, logically be your first touching point to work on this. Very nice. Great. Thank you guys for your inputs. Good. So today, um, I already mentioned there has been a slight change of the program because very sadly, um, Paul Hoylund from Norun. Uh, in Denmark has written me today that he has fallen ill and sadly cannot join the webinar today anymore. Um, he is very, he was very apologetic. And of course, um, I said, <laughs> as I'm sure you would all say as well, uh, that health comes first. Uh, but we did already talk briefly about maybe finding a new date to have his presentation. Nonetheless, if you would already like to learn a little bit more about the work of Noron and how they are shaping park identity through architecture and co-creation processes, then I very much welcome you to check out um, the most recent edition of our Protected Areas Insight, because on page 26, there is also an article written by Noron exactly on this process. Again, my colleague Sandra will put that link in the chat for you. Nonetheless, I'm very happy to say that our other speaker, Nicolette Bolte, can be with us today. Uh, Nicolette is an area developer at National Park Veribevide in the Netherlands. And very recently, the protected area has gone through an identity creation process to feed into a marketing campaign. So... Um, I welcome now Nicolette to take the floor. Again, as I said, feel free to write your questions in the chat or alternatively, you can wait until after her presentation to share them with us. So Nicolette, the floor is all yours. Well, thank you, Esther. And um, well, welcome uh, everybody. Good to see you here um, uh, in this uh, webinar. I'm uh, more than happy to... Um, tell you a little bit more about um, how we went through the process of um, shaping, creating an identity and use it and turn it into uh, a marketing campaign. Um, a little bit about the topics. Yeah, I will tell you a little bit more how we worked on this, um, what the results were, uh, how we used it in our promotions, um, I'll tell you a little bit more about our marketing strategy, about the target group, how we used it last year, um, what our steps for this year are and for next year. Yeah, a little bit more about where uh, we are. Um, we are in the Netherlands and um, the Netherlands has got 21 national parks. We are uh, one of them. We are located a little bit, yeah, as you can see, in the middle north of uh, the Netherlands. Um, it's a large national park. 
um, and um, it's like it's uh, we have got a lot around uh, eleven thousand hectares of um, uh, uh, grand, uh, land. It's not all nature two thousand. It's also a cultural area. Um, our biggest USP is that we have the largest low moorland swamp uh, in northwestern uh, Europe. Um, our um, symbol is the otter uh, because. It was uh, replaced there um, uh, more than 20 years ago. Um, so that's our sign. Um, yeah, and the landscape is very, very diverse. We have uh, farming, but we also have uh, sa sailing villages like Giethoorn. Maybe you know uh, that village because it's well known internationally. Um, we've got little towns and uh, we also have got um, a bigger city, it's just called Steinweg. So it's really diverse uh, 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 landscape of nature and culture. To, well, it started like three years ago, we went to a national park new style, which means that it's not only about nature and uh, the nature area, but it's also about culture, history, etc. what we can tell. Um, and part of that process was, as you can see, it's in Dutch, unfortunately, but um, the second step of this process was um, to um, pinpoint your identity, turn it into a brand identity, because that's the basis of uh, further communication um, offers, et cetera, et cetera. So um, having an identity or creating an identity is really important um, uh, to, to, yeah, to process or to, um, uh, yeah. Um, a little bit of theory. This is a model, um, you might know it, but it's uh, linked, it's, it's the link between identity and image. As you can see in, in the left side, the identity is a center and it's linked to um, stories, communication, design and offer, but amongst it is the people. So all these different parts create an identity uh, because I liked it when I saw it in a Mentimeter, a lot of people, a lot of, of you mentioned the locals, the inhabitants, and it's really important because they are a re really big part creating the identity of a destination. And next to that is image. So an identity creates an image and um, so it's really linked to each other. What did we do? We uh, hired um, uh, an external organization, which is called New Growth Strategies. They do a lot of these processes for the national parks or other areas in the Netherlands. So they're really experienced. And um, we asked them to help us with this process. And um, what they did is um, they had a look at what already existed because this was not new for us. We already did it a couple of years ago. So they looked at all the existing documents, what has already been done. Um, they... Um, interviewed eight stakeholders um, and this was uh, from the municipality to inhabitants to entrepreneurs to a very diverse um, palette of stakeholders so they took all the stories from them and there was this um, online questionnaire which was online for a couple of weeks and um, inhabitants could uh, could answer this questionnaire which was used for creating the character of uh, our area. Uh, so this was the result from all this what they have done in the first step. Uh, we call it the quirky cordial. Um, this is a model, it's from Brand Positioner, but it's it's uh, it consists of eight different characters as you can see although it's in Dutch but um, it's like um, cordial, uh, adventurous, um, uh, a leader, etc., etc. So based on the results from the first step, we, we, we for sure we were um, cordial. Um, that's the orange cor co color. So that's really linked to um, how welcome. And the, or the red one is the uh, adventure part. So we took that as a positioning because, as you might know, um, position yourself is really important in 
putting yourself on the market and being different or distinct from other national parks or other areas. So we used it and we said, okay, we are the quirky cordial. Um, then we formed a team. Um, and again, I'm really happy that you mentioned all these stakeholders yourself and the Mentimeter, but we created a team of different people, as you can see, entrepreneurs, um, uh, farmers, foresters, inhabitants, of course, um, municipality, but also nature education. So we took all these people, communication experts, we took all these people together and we had three different sessions guided by new uh, growth strategies in which we they took us through the process and it was three sessions of almost half, uh, half a day. So it really took us a lot of effort and time, but it's rich, the results were really great and uh, really helpful um, to bring us further. Yeah, so this is the process. So the first session was really about the why, why we're doing this, why we want to um, uh, create or not create an identity, but a pinpoint an identity. Um, the next one uh, was about the developing. So this is the positioning. This is our story. Do we agree? So this was all created by this team, storylines. And the uh, third step was, okay, we have this on paper, but the next step is to bring it out to the market. So really work on this because it's nice to have something on paper, but you should activate it. It's really important. So in the last process, the last meeting, um, we had the last final touches on the positioning um, and agreed on, okay, how we, we can all use it. And, um, but also, okay, we have this quirky cordial and we have this um, <clears throat> value um, propositions. How do we use it in offer? Yeah, because there were entrepreneurs there because, and, and communication. So we created um, a brand guide and uh, which is spread out in the market, which says, okay, this is the tone of voice we can use. These are the images we can use. These are the, um, the offers that are um, working for this identity. Um, if you want, I can share the link of this brand guide because we have it digitally. I can share it later on in the chat. So this was the result. This is a brand house. Um, and um, in the center is like what we are saying, what we stayed for. And it's um, each time full of wonder. Huh? Whatever day, time of the day, uh, whatever um, period in the year, you will visit our area each time you turn around the corner and you will be surprised. Huh? That's our main statement. Then... Our promise, um, that, that's our promise. Then our statement, which is on the top, a dynamic area that really touches you. And this is what we, what we stand for. Around it are the five yeah, value propositions, keywords that fit our identity. Um, so we are quirky and cordial, but besides that, we are also magic. We are attentively and uh, we use the human skill. So the strategic goals of our marketing plan, uh, which was written uh, last year and which is still um, valid, um, we um, think or we state that um, not only visitors, but also residents, so inhabitants and entrepreneurs are target groups. So it moves from um, basic destination promotion to more destination management. Then we say that sustainable tourism as a destination reciprocity. Um, so it gives something back. Cross-border coalition. So we we are close to to other provinces, and but we don't think in borders. Huh? We try to seek um, coalitions, so cooperations. We have the quality visit visitor, which I will explain to you next slide, but this is a type of visitor we described. We think it's really important and we use data. 
for in, uh, for insight on impact of uh, what, uh, the things we do. So um, this is um, the quality visitor. It's it's put in orange, um, and I always have this discussion, but I will explain it uh, immediately, what we mean with this, because I can hear you think, okay, how can you have more visitors in a protected area or in a national park? Um, the thing, what we think about it is that we have chosen for the quality visitor is that it's a visitor that respects the nature that respects the area that um, not only comes for fun but also for more insight um, a visitor that uh, not only goes to the most popular places but also to the areas around it so we can spread the visitors in location and in time so we also want to attract visitors in the low seasons or even in winter, we are investigating, huh, doing a research, if that is possible. So that is why, so we want to attract more visitors, but not specifically in high season or at the locations that are already popular or crowded. Huh? So we want to spread the visitors in time and in place. So what we did last year, um, our main goal was to create awareness national level and um, so these are just a few things what we did. Um, you can see the color orange and I can explain the slogan, uh, Moi dat je bent, good to see you here. As you said, we are the quirky cordial and the color orange is linked to cordial. So um, that's why we chose the color orange. Of course, it's also our national color. Huh? If our national team plays um, whatever sports, it's orange. Um, and the slogan, good to see you here, it states a sense of welcome. Huh? Since we are the quirky cordial, so it's, it's good to see you here. You are more than welcome in our national park. So that was the main focus, the main idea behind our slogan. So we started with this nationally last year. Uh, we did radio, we did, um, as you can see, billboards uh, next to the highways in the western part of the Netherlands, which is more crowded. Um, we used signage in the area. Uh, we had this little metal signs you can see on the... We, um, pinned in on basically everywhere where we could. And we asked entrepreneurs, we asked stakeholders in the area, use this sign and put it anywhere you want in your um, uh, organization. We have a magazine, we have leaflets, um, we have an app, but that app was launched already the year before that. But that app is really helpful for us to guide all the visitors that we have in our park through our national park. Eh? So if you talk about spread in, um, in a place, we um, can promote the events or the locations where we want the visitors to go. So that app is still running. And um, really at the right uh, low corner, you can see the business gala. And this was really the biggest well, compliment, I think we received from the, uh, entrepreneurs, because this was a business gala for the lo for the um, local all uh, entrepreneurs. So not only tourism, but uh, from every industry, and they used our slogan uh, for their business gala. So I think if you talk about stakeholders, that this is really a big compliment. And um, what we also noticed, because we are now a year further, that or. Uh, Every time we meet people, they say to us, it's good to see you here. And we say it to them. So it's getting more and more of a slogan used also by inhabitants, by entrepreneurs. So I think it's working well because what we did with this process that took stakeholders from all kinds of uh, different areas, they... Um, um, we have the, the goal for this uh, um, slogan from different perspectives, uh, from different stakeholders. So it's 
yeah, it's carried by them, supported. What is the historical background of Virip and Vida? A history is always shaped by the accounts of witnesses. Dig deep enough and you will go back in time. You will find the remains from the Ice Age, from the residents who walked alongside the mammoths in this area. You will find our ancestors who were there when the ice retreated. During the formation of the low terminal moraines, the Via Ribbon Viden area originated. You encounter the Stone Age person who resided and worked in this location as a farmer around 5,000 years in the past. You stumbled upon peat diggers, reed cutters. They are all vital and irreplaceable elements of a truly exceptional and unparalleled national park. And even today, you will meet the people who, together with nature, shape this beautiful area. The DNA of all those people, of all those stories and connections. From the original inhabitants to the visitors of tomorrow. The DNA is situated in Weirib and Weedon. It's great to have you here. Enjoy your time. Thanks for also bringing to life the history and future of National Park Wirenben Vida. So we used this video, um, we launched the promotional campaign of uh, this year, last March. And um, what we did is, you could see in the end of this video, there was this man. You could also see the video, the man with the orange coat. That's our character. And uh, what we did, because last year we really spoke, uh, like, um, um, visit, uh, visit me, come to me. So we thought we have to give it a, a face. Uh, we have to give our national park a face to make it more personal. So what our um, advertisement agency did, they used AI, uh, which is quite new. Uh, so they typed in the DNA, so the five main keywords for our identity, which is our DNA of the area. And they came up with this person, this man, uh, which is a typical visitor, or not typical inhabitant, uh, uh, a personification of our area and um, we also found a real person so um, what we will do in our communications now we will focus on national so Dutch visitors but also German uh, the Germans who are living close to the border of the Netherlands because we know that for 20% of the visitors they come from that area, 80% is Dutch and um, we will use this person in our, all our um, communication. So we will focus on a social media marketing campaign, Instagram and Facebook and we will have this man telling the story, welcoming visitors to focus um, on the dreaming phase. If we talk about the Google customer journey, maybe this is too marketing language, but what we do is uh, we have this phase that people, and you might notice it for yourself, that you are, you are aware that you want to go somewhere on a holiday or some had to do something and all of a sudden you see some kind of advertisement uh, popping up in your Facebook or your Instagram um, timeline. And then you think, hey, Vida Vida, or whatever your area, that might be an interesting, I've never thought about it, but you just, it pops up. So it is there in the heads of a potential visitor. So that's what we want to do. Right? We want to attract those um, uh, persons and um, yeah so we have made we have given it a face we have given our um, national park a face with this we call him Wout but it's a typical Dutch name um, yeah so he will be our our promotional uh, face yeah and last but not least for uh, next year we are now working on uh, to get, to get uh, the charter for sustainable tourism because I can hear you think again, like, oh, all those visitors, how is it linked to sustainable tourism? Um, but we, it's key for us. For us, sustainable tourism is really key. One of my colleagues is working on this. And um, um, 
we think that the Charter for Sustainable Tourism fits perfectly with uh, our campaign and by all the activities we do, because um, there's one of the steps in getting the Charter for Sustainable Tourism is that it's about communication and it's about communication and marketing materials and promoting, et cetera, et cetera, to the visitors. Yeah? So you, you provide proper and good information and also in a good way. And um, this campaign is also linked to so that tourism entrepreneurs, uh, businesses and stakeholders, they are well informed and they provide uh, relevant information to the visitors. So we think, uh, and this, um, it, it, it matches, the campaign matches the, um, our movement to the Charter for Sustainable Tourism perfectly. That was my last slide. So I'm really happy to answer any questions if there are. Great. Thank you so much, Nicolette, for your presentation. Um, I think it really shows a very large process of how this identity creation can come to be with many different aspects. And the exciting thing is, is of course, that it's still developing. So even though I already knew about this campaign, I did not know about Wout, uh, the personification of the area, which I think is a wonderful example of, um, yeah, how can I how can I make this area, you know, a, a landscape? How can I make that personal? And yeah. of course, always putting a a face to that is is a great idea. So so thank you very much for that. Um, we have some questions in the in the chat, and um, indeed, actually, one of the first questions that came in uh, was from Jana, and I have a. I might, that was actually the same question I also wrote down, Jana. So um, you mentioned that uh, within this national park new style, um, it was important to include this um, identity development. Um, but yeah, why was that included within it? Was it just for marketing reasons? Um, or yeah, why, why was that an essential element of this new style of national parks? Um, yeah, if, um, when I showed you the, the steps hey, you had to take to, um, to go there, this was the second step. And the idea behind is that um, it's not only for marketing, because the first step was uh, creating um, a, a landscape, uh, uh, um, how do you say it? Bibliography, yeah, I don't know the word. Uh, that, that was the first step. So that was also an agency that took us there. So that really digged in to our history and the existence of our area, how it was created by nature, by man, etc., etc. So it went back to the Ice Age. And um, that was the first step. And the second step was, okay, how can you use this to create an identity of your area and the identity is used for communication but also for uh, creating offer but also to create a kind of proud or um how do you say it cooperation um, um bonding uh, so a feel a, 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 um, a common sense of proud of an area uh, because that's what I also noticed in this process when we had this team of different people working on this. It created bonding. It created a kind of common sense, common feeling, proud of, um, of the area. So that was also a really important side effect of this uh, process. Thank you. Very good. Um, I have some more questions in the chat. However, if somebody, and we'll go through those first, <laughs> but if somebody would like to speak up or make a comment or ask a question directly to Nicolette, please do so by raising your hand. You can do so uh, at the bottom. There is reactions and then you can do the little raise hand reaction. Um, this will allow Sandra to then give you the rights to unmute yourself. So, uh, Feel free to do that for a lively discussion. Um, there was another question uh, from Annemieke. 
And she's wondering why you are then focusing the campaign on the Netherlands and Germany if you would actually really like visitors to extend um, their stay. So would it not be more pertinent to extend the campaign to people that are living further away as they are more likely to stay for, for multiple days? That's a good question. Um, we base our choices on um, the Dutch... Um, Tourism Board. It's called the Dutch Tourism Board for uh, Tourism and Con Conferences. And they do this research to, so we know where the main visitors come from who visit the Netherlands as a country. And the top one and so uh, is, is Germany, it's Belgium, it's Britain, but also the USA. Um, we chose to focus on Germany first simply because of budget. Um, we have limited promotional budget and um, so we do it step by step. That's the main reason. So we've chosen to put our marketing money on uh, where we have the most chance of people visiting our area. And the Germans, they do come to our area for multiple days. Thank you. Nicolette. And I can actually uh, confirm, I have also visited the Viribevide area in November for uh, multiple days. So um, even the Dutch sometimes stay, stay for a longer time. Um, and I can wholeheartedly recommend it. Yes. <laughs> um, then there was a question from my, from my colleague, actually, uh, Sana, who is asking if national parks in the Netherlands are working together to promote national parks or are there, yeah, is there a competition over visitors? Um, and also are different national parks trying to build their different identities in order to stand out from each other? Good question. Um, yeah, we do work together. Um, and to be more concrete, uh, last um, autumn, I was a member of, uh, we went to a process ourselves, not about with all the national parks. The, the goal was to um, put on paper the common story of all Dutch national parks. So where do the national parks stand for, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we went to, with new growth strategies, so the same agency, we went to the same process, but now I was a member of the team. And I could bring in, uh, so there were many other national parks, but also other stakeholders. And um, together we've put on paper the common story of all national parks. Um, we have uh, we have the same logo, it's called an NNMP, so we, we all use it. And then we have the author as a symbol, but then all the, each national park has its own little symbol that that, that um, the park puts next to the M and the P. So, um, yeah, we do communicate with the same logo and we, eat, we, we are um, chosen as national parks just because of our uniqueness. So each park in the Netherlands, it's unique for whatever reason, uh, for um, existence or so they are all, we do not compete for visitors. Great. Thank you, Nicolette. So those were the current questions in the chat. Um, not sure if there's somebody who would... Ah, <laughs> our executive director has raised her head perfectly. So, Carol, the floor is yours. You should be able to unmute. I can. Yep, thank you very much. I was lurking in the background there. Um, thank you very much, Nicoletta, for your presentation and for everyone present here today. So really, my comments and question isn't specifically to you, Nicoletta, but obviously I'd be interested in your perspective, but really to, to throw it out to the wider group. <clears throat> because uh, identity and a sense of place is something that's very intrinsic in all of us. Um, and yet it's a very dynamic process as well. So both our individual identities and our sense of place changes over time, sometimes perceptibly and sometimes in, imperceptibly over generations. And particularly us in Europe, we're a very uh, mobile population. And some of the populations that are present in the present day countries may not necessarily be the original, original, original 
populations uh, from times gone by, and indeed the present populations that are in our countries are themselves changing. So I just wanted to unpick that a little bit um, in the sense of the, I think it's very courageous for you to have uh, created a personification identity for the National Park. Because I wonder if there are any inherent risks in doing that in terms of diversity and inclusivity. Because I looked at your brand guidelines and I have to say it's not very diverse. So by by personifying your identity as a national park, are, are there risks in there of people who can't then or don't identify with that because they don't look the same as the identity that you're utilising yeah. in your personification? Um, so I think that that's something we as a national park community or a parks community, yeah, we need to unpick that. And I think particularly because you you mentioned this from a marketing perspective, but also from a community bonding and pride perspective. And there's two kind of a, not quite conflicting, but there, there's two alternative elements there that need to be, that need to be come together. But thinking on the visitor attraction uh, side of things as well, again, if we choose a particular identity to personify, how do we then attract a wider audience who don't see themselves necessarily as a white middle-aged man in you know, whatever guise uh, you, you choose to use. So I'm not saying I have any answers there, but th those are the kind of provocative uh, questions that, 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 you know, pop into my head. Um, and there's certainly this issue over diversity, inclusivity and identity um, changing over time. I'd just be interested in other people's points of view on that and thoughts and reflections, and perhaps your own experience having gone through the, this this process in the, the Netherlands, Nicoletta. Yeah, good question or good... No, it's not a question, it's an, a thought. Huh? Uh, um, we have went to, the, to this, and um, I can explain how we used this, um, this process. Um, first of all, um, it's not necessarily that a visitor could, could or should not feel, um, how do you say it, attracted by this person. Because what we did, it's really this, what the, our agency did, they typed in the characteristics, so the DNA, the words in this system and this AI system came popped up with this person we had the discussion about this inclusivity should it should it be well colored should it be of another nationality should it be a woman but then we thought we looked really looked at the dna of our area and we thought no it the inhabitants it it's it fits the area it fits the area and um, um, so it's 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 okay like this then to um, provide this uh, discussion we have put his face online so we did a kind of poll on facebook and um, we presented him not saying that we will use him in his campaign but just like um, I am uh, I am your guide in the national park. Would you like to come with me or something like that? We have we we asked this question, and um, the reactions were positive. And so then it was for us okay. Um, it fits our park and it fits our identity. But my colleague Herald also has raised his hand because we went to this process together. So he might have an uh, additional answer. Good morning to everyone. Um, yeah, I find this, this discussion very interesting because it's something we discuss uh, on a regular basis. Uh, we we also have a program in our national park or or in the Netherlands which is called um, I'm 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 trying to translate it properly but Nicolette maybe you you can help me um, it's uh, the gastheren gastvrouwen uh, hosts of the Host. uh, national parks 
and now that that's very interesting because host is is could could be uh, male or female, um, but in Holland we have a different word. It's called gast here or a gast vrouw. And we have had uh, quite a number of discussions about gast heer, which is male, and gast vrouw, which is women, uh, because we would like to um, have a more inclusive term for the uh, for the program, uh, which in English is very uh, is more simple because you can use the word host, um, but in in Dutch we don't have uh, a word like that. So um, that's what we did recently is change the name of the program to, to, to let it be more inclusive. And we chose for this character, uh, which uh, Nicolette has, uh, has shown you, uh, our vow to tell the story, to be the personal guide in Vere Bevide, because we thought he would be most representative of the area. But nevertheless, we have in... in, in, in uh, the, the, the people we use in other images uh, represent the the the, 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 the broad uh, variety of people who live in our area and who live in the Netherlands. And at the same time, um, our country is is a, a very um, a populated country. Some would say crowded in some places. And nevertheless, in our part of the the Netherlands of of uh, in in Bevide, um it's much more traditional than comparing it to Amsterdam uh or to the more populated areas in the in the country so the choice for a character in Amsterdam would absolutely be a different person than the choice for a character who represents uh the area um but I think it's it's good for national parks to be uh, focused on being inclusive. Also, because uh, we see the uh, perception of the worth of nature, the worth of protected areas, uh, the need to preserve is uh, perspective is is um, is different in different cultures. So I think it's a very good point to keep addressing this. Question. So, thank you very much, uh, Carol, if I may say so. Mm. Yes, thank you, Carol. Thank you, Harold. Thank you, Nicoletta. I think it's uh, it's always a, a balance to strike. Of course, it's an interesting approach, as I said, to personify an area. Um, but of course, to to what extent could that potentially perce be perceived as also excluding others? That is an ongoing discussion. Um, that I think is good for the protected area to be aware of. Um, I saw one more question has also popped up in the chat, so I'll just post that here. Um, when you were going through the identification, I, identity identification process, which is a, is a fun word, um, were these results that came out, the, the quirky cordial, as you call it, was that surprising or were you sort of expecting that this is what what would come out of that process it's a good one no we did not expect to be cordial because the inhabitants the locals of our area they are a bit stubborn they are um yeah not not really if you meet them for the first time they are quite closed and not really welcoming yeah and so they are um so that was really a kind of a surprise and um but the inhabitants in our team they immediately said yes but we are and they gave examples and the discussion started and everybody said yeah but we do are uh, cordial and we do our welcoming etc etc so all of a sudden this discussion started and then we said, okay, but, but first, yes, we uh, the, the first results were really surprising. And then we said, we if if you had a look at the characteristic, the character um, image, there's this green part, which is more linked to caring, etc., which would fit a national park better, uh, because uh, you care and you are more the green part. 
But then we said, okay, but it might be so that each national park is, if you look at the characters, they are green. So if we want to be unique and position ourselves in a unique way and be different, we take the red, so the uh, quirky. So because that does fit the inhabitants, that does fit the locals and the if you are in the area that does fit it they are they are quirky the people are quirky so yeah that one fitted perfectly well so the combination of those two was a perfect uh, match yeah great thank you nicolette so we're now an hour in obviously we still have half an hour theoretically because uh, obviously we didn't have our second presentation um so i do yeah. have a question uh, esther um, yes to hear out my colleague if he can share the our brand guide uh, which was the result it was a leaflet of our identity process if you can uh, hear that if you can share the link uh, the online link in the chat i think i think it's there so, uh, we've had yeah. it before no, but it's, that's the landscapes uh, bi uh, biography it's not the brand guide so I think a little bit up. <laughs> I think both were shared, but either way, we will also put it in oh, the okay. outcomes email. Uh, so I'm happy to share that. I'm posting that. once again. Thank you, Sandra. No worries. Okay. Perfect. Okay, if there's no other questions, still feel free to either raise your hand or put it in the chat, of course. Um, then I would just like to take this opportunity to again thank Nicolette for um, yeah all of a sudden having to to carry this webinar but I think you did uh, you did so splendidly and also thank you to all that stayed with us we were over 60 people throughout the the past hour so I think that is a testament to the interest uh, in this topic um, and I think some very valid points were raised about identity and how dynamic it can be or will be, and nothing is fixed. And I'm sure that this will be a continuous yeah, debate and process. And I hope that more parks and protected areas um, look at yeah look at this process and see how they could potentially um, apply that to their situation. Sorry, Esther, before we close, we do have one more question um, uh -huh. uh, from Anemike again. Uh, do they use the flourishing business canvas to develop regenerative tourism? I know the canvas, uh, I must say, because um, uh, we don't use it yet, but this canvas specifically, but we do work on regenerative tourism. So it's key. We do work always with students from universities of applied sciences with different backgrounds. And they, uh, most of the time, they are working on projects linked to regenerative tourism. So it's really a hot topic for us. Perfect, thank you. Okay, super. Good, I think that, that was it for today. Um, again, thank you all for joining us. Um, I have one final request and this will only take maximum two minutes of your time but at Europark we continuously want to improve our work because in the end we are doing these things for you for the protected area community so to help us improve um we'd love if you could provide us with your feedback in the link that Sandra has just shared in the chat it really if you really take your time, it will take you maybe two minutes. So um, seeing that the webinar is shorter today, I think everybody has a little bit of time left to do it. It will be super helpful. Um, the next webinar is actually coming up next week. Check out our website under the events page. It will be on stakeholder engagement as part of our Natura Connect uh, project. So again, I think it will be, uh, it is expected to be an exciting webinar. So I will for sure attend and I hope to see many of you there. Thank you, Sandra. That's also already in the chat. Um, so thanks again. We will share the outcomes with you in the upcoming days. And we hope to see you again soon at any of the other uh, Euro Park events, either online or face to face. For now, have a great weekend and see you soon. Bye bye.